Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock, a plane is on standby to take the first asylum seekers from the UK to Rwanda under the government's controversial immigration scheme. But in the last hour, the lawyer for one of the men, Jacqueline McKenzie, told LBC the European Court of Human Rights has blocked his removal tonight. We've got one case... For a client, a case we took on last night because we found that he was unrepresented, which is one of the issues in this, um, that people haven't had time to get adequate legal representation. And in the, about an hour ago, we got an injunction. Ministers insist the policy will save lives by putting migrants off crossing the channel in small boats. Hundreds of people have taken part in a silent walk from Grenfell Tower in West London to mark the fifth anniversary of the fire in which 72 people lost their lives. Dozens of firefighters lined the road. Earlier, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge joined a memorial service. Downing Street has rejected the case for a new Scottish independence referendum. First Minister Nicola Sturgeon has started a campaign for a second vote, saying there's a strong and compelling argument. Cricket, Johnny Besto hit seven sixes at Trent Bridge as he made 136 to help England storm to a five-wicket victory and a series win against New Zealand in the second test. In the city, the FTSE 100 closed down 18 points at 71.87. The pound buys $1.19 and €1.15. LBC weather dry tonight with clear spells. Tomorrow, sunny across most of England and Wales. Some showers elsewhere, highs of 27 degrees. From Global's Newsroom for LBC, I'm Andy Ivey. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation cross question with Ian Dale. Hello, very good evening. It is two minutes past eight on LBC. Welcome to Tuesday's edition of Cross Question. On the panel with me this evening, we have Juliet Samuel, the Telegraph columnist, Ishan Akbar, comedian and podcaster, James Sunderland, Conservative MP for Bracknell and PPS to George Eustace, the DEFRA Secretary, and Francis O'Grady, the General Secretary of the TUC. Lots to talk about tonight. Looking forward to your questions. 0345 6060 973 is the number you need to dial. And you can watch us on Global. Global player. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Well, I'm very disappointed that I thought the first question would be on cricket. If you were watching the cricket today, what a day for England. But it's not on cricket. Harry is in Waltham Forest. Tell us what you want to ask, Harry. Good evening. Good evening, panel. Uh, the question is that given the French government appears to be turning a blind eye to the cross-channel illegal trafficking people, why isn't the French government in the dock for aiding and abetting the people traffickers? How, how do you draw the conclusion that they're aiding and abetting them? Well, they appear to be turning a blind eye to the traffic, given that some 10,000 have come across since the beginning of the year. 60,000 so far, I understand, in total. OK, James Sunderland. Well, it's a fair question, but uh, one of the things that we're not completely exposed to in the UK is the fact that the French authorities are making a difference. So the British government has spent a lot of money um, in supporting the French government, turn these um, migrants around, and uh, it is a fact of life that the French government has actually stopped the majority of crossings. It's the ones that slip through that are the ones we're dealing with. Stop. Why, why do you, you say the majority of crossings? Somebody on the programme last night, I can't remember who, said that they'd stopped 45% of the crossings that's not the message that the government is giving us. They're, they're basically saying they're stopping very few. Well, I mean, the figures are varying, depending on who you talk to. I had a good briefing last week from the Home Office, um, and what came as a surprise to me, the French authorities have been vilified in the press. They've been given a very hard time because of the, of, of the money that it's costing, but they're making a difference. But, of course, they can't cover the totality of all of the beaches all of the time, and, um, and clearly once these boats cross that median line in the channel, they become a British responsibility, and, and we take that seriously. But the argument also is that, and um, I saw something about this yesterday, that French, uh, the French Navy ships are still accompanying boats to the halfway line and then leaving them to the British. Well, I've not heard that. And, um, you know, I think that it depends which prism you look through in terms of that particular answer. But uh, all, all I can tell you is that uh, it is a British responsibility at the point at which they get to the halfway line. We know that uh, these blokes are still slipping through. We know there's a problem. We know they're coming across to UK shores and therefore we have to pick up the tab and deal with it when they arrive. Francis O'Grady. 
I think if we really wanted to tackle the people smugglers, then we'd provide safe routes, safe and legal routes for people to be able to claim asylum. And I think most people in this country care about doing the decent thing. And we've got people who are fleeing persecution, war, torture, rape, um, mums and dads, children who want to be reunited. And it seems to me that the decent thing to do would be to respect the international laws that we're signed up to uh, that were, came about after the Second World War and the Holocaust and all the horror of that and the importance of every country taking its responsibility to provide the right for people to claim asylum and do that in a way that gives people dignity. I think, for example, that you know, all, all our experiences is that asylum seekers would like the right to work. They want to contribute. They want Which to raise Ukrainian a family. Which Ukrainian asylum seekers are being given the right to work. Well, exactly, but not all, are they? So, um, you know, in fact, it's been very hard for a number of Ukrainian people to come to this country, let alone from Syria, from Afghanistan and many other countries where people are experiencing horrors. And I, I think most people in this country have big hearts and we've seen that through the Ukrainian crisis. Um, and, was, and safe routes would stop. Would, that would be the best way to But the government the say model. that uh, why is it that people who are trying to come to this country via Calais, why haven't they stopped in one of the countries that they've travelled through yeah. on the way? But as you know, Ian, international law... I'm just saying what the yeah, for, exactly. But what what we're signed up to as a country is that UN convention that does give people the right to seek asylum here if they want to, because it's very very often about families reuniting, and I think it's hard for most of us to imagine the experiences that people are going through. But most of us have enough empathy to know that it's you know it's the right thing to do that when families want to be together well, you say most of us know that and i think over yeah. ukraine i think you'd be right on that mm. but is that the same here and is is there some sort of racial element to this where people seem perfectly happy to have as many ukrainians come here as, as want to come well, but don't seem happy to have afghans and syrians come here well i think ministers have to answer the question as to why there is different treatment for you know asylum seekers from different countries and why that may appear to be certainly seems to be the case that uh, ukrainians for example were, you know you can come and work here mm. um, that wasn't a right that was offered to others but we have seen safe routes used before uh, for okay. different countries and i think we should do it's worked and we should do that now if we really really want to break that business model Isha. I think it's absolutely hilarious and embarrassing that as a state we're arguing over people who choose to take an unsafe route and somehow they seem to be more dangerous. The fact that people are choosing to take unsafe routes suggests to me that there's a real desperation to doing that. And here we are arguing about the nitty gritty and they're splitting hairs about safe routes and unsafe routes. At its core, there seems to be a lack of consistency and there seems to be a lack of humanity. We've created, seems to have created this two-tier system between certain types of refugees. If you're a Syrian refugee who's been waiting, or an Eritrean refugee who's been waiting two, three years for a decision about your refugee status in the UK, and you've gone through the legal routes, and then you see a Ukrainian person walk in to a ho you know, house a Ukrainian scheme, and they have somewhere to stay for six months and so, you'd be thinking there, what is going on? What is the difference between me and this person? And people, I, I've seen so many debates on on Twitter, look, I'm here as a, as a comedian, so I don't have the data to hand. All I can do is, as an observer of how we behave towards people, to me, something is a bit wrong. It seems like certain refugees are preferred over others, and I don't want to pray oppression top trumps, that's what I'm here to do, <laughs> but suddenly it feels like that's what we're doing. We're saying, actually, the oppression that the Ukrainians are facing seems to be significantly worse, so that we as a country then decide that these are the people we want to treat in this way. Do you think it's something to do with the immediacy of the Ukrainian war um, and that a lot of the people that are coming here from other countries now, whether it's Iran, Afghanistan, Syria, um, that the, the problems in their countries have been there for a long time. So we're sort of almost but, immune to them. Well, I think there's, there's an immunity thing, but the problems in those countries are arguably our creation. 
ultimately things that happened in Afghanistan and the things that the, the weapons that we sell, the people that we get into bed with, there's lots of other socio-economic geopolitical things that I'm not going to discuss here, but Britain has a lot to answer for as to why those people are choosing to come to this country. I'm from an Asian background, dad's Pakistani, mum's Bangladeshi. The reason we migra my parents migrated to this country absolutely has to do with the fact that England made themselves very welcome in countries like India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. By the way, countries that didn't exist in 1947. And these new countries existed, these borders got created, and the whole principle of being a refugee or an immigrant, I still think makes me feel a bit icky, actually, because borders are entirely man-made. And now we've decided that actually we're going to make these rules for these people, but not these people. And it makes me feel very uncomfortable in terms of the humanity that we want to extend to the world for Britain to be the kind of nation that we're proud of. And at the moment, I'm not very proud to be a British person at all, just given the way that we've dealt with... with Juliet? Countries. Well, I think that... Um, I think that this country does have a huge amount of compassion for refugees, um, as we've seen with Ukraine and as we've seen um, with the Hong Kong scheme and as we saw before with a Syrian scheme which took people from the region who were in refugee camps and assessed them and brought them over in family units. What I think people have a problem with is the sense of an uncontrolled um, flow of people who we don't actually know who they are or where they're going or where they've passed through. And there's an assumption in this conversation that all of these people are refugees. The fact is we actually have no idea. Some of them I'm sure are refugees and some of them probably aren't refugees. And I think that it's, it's, you know, it's fine to talk about safe and legal routes, but the point is that this, while there is a limit on the number of people that this country can take, you know, with, with accounting for social cohesion, um, you know, and the resources available, then there, there is going to be an incentive for people to land on the shores of this country and either then go into the system that way or disappear. And the whole point of the Rwanda scheme is to remove the incentive. It's not to actually send thousands of people to Rwanda. The, the whole point is to stop the crossings. And I don't, see, do I don't that. see how sorry, that you can... Sorry, how Julia, you can, but you're not going to well, do that by sending 500 people each year. That That is a fraction. Well, if you said th is, every everybody who comes across the channel will go to Rwanda, I mean, I wouldn't agree with that, but it would be... There's that, is, logic that, that, to that. Is, that is, that is the, uh, the, in theory, the aim of the scheme. There's a question as to the government's competence and capacity to do it but the principle of saying we do not think this is an acceptable situation for 25,000 people a year who we have no idea who they are um, who are often you know traveling alone uh, not in family units um, who haven't been assessed often have no paperwork to, to arrive on the shores of this country I mean um, and I don't and I don't think pa paperwork is a tricky thing to pick up when yeah, I, uh, bombs flying around it's, yes which is why which is why the whole about. system which is why the whole system doesn't work because you can't say to people, you know, yeah. produce your paperwork, right? So yeah. then you have to enter them into a system where, you know, there's an appeals process, which is, you know, which is right. And, you know, that, and it has to be done okay. properly. But there, but there isn't an efficient way to do that. Well, when you have a strong did incentive it. Did for, it for thousands of people arriving, uh, arriving it, every year. They had toys for the children in what, the airports. They process people mm. when they arrived. They understood that when you're Wait, facing... Sorry, I, I missed the start. When, you said the UK Ireland, or Europe. Ireland. 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 Mm -hmm. France takes twice as many well, refugees the, yeah, as us. Yes, Germany this, takes but, three times but this as is, many. Yes, but this, this is, you, the, ex, the systems you were talking about are examples of systems where there is a an organised process where people have, um, you know, ha, have... Uh, well, we find out who people are and what their circumstances are, and then they are allowed to, to you know, to go into the system. Okay, but, so but, but, but when that, Ger when Germany and Sweden had a, had a situation where you know thousands of people were just arriving, that wasn't sustainable, and they they you know rightly said but, that but we have to But what is the logic this. of sending people to a country which we take refugees from? Rwanda, yeah. people from Rwanda come here seeking mm -hmm. refugee well, status. It, we we don't take on a blanket level take refugees from Rwanda, we assess their situation. If they have been persecuted in Rwanda, then yes, we accept but you, them. But, you, but, but, but you're, ha not, you're happy for, to sending... send people to Rwanda mm. to a country that persecutes people? Well, it, it, no. I mean, I, I would rather that no one made an illegal crossing and then that no one was no, sent course, to Rwanda. No one wants anyone to but, make an illegal but the, crossing. But, of the, po but the point is that you... Um, 
when when people come here from Rwanda who are, who uh, have been persecuted, then that's when we accept them. We mm. say it's not as but if how can we be sure people that people go there the middle of aren't Europe. going to be persecuted? I mean, if you if you're a gay refugee, for example, I'm not sure Rwanda is possibly the best place to send you. And well, can I this just... this is part of I mean the deal that the that the UK has struck with Rwanda is to process you know is to keep people in humane conditions. And to assess them, so then, you know, and to may, assess may them say, there. May I just say, therefore, the insinuation is that because we don't have the systems here and with the numbers that we're talking about, there's a Eurocentricity to the numbers we quote. Turkey has 3.7 million refugees, Pakistan 1.4 million, Uganda 1.2 million, Sudan 1.1 million. Therefore, we're saying that those countries have better systems in place, have better controls in place than the United mm -hmm kingdom and we want to present ourselves as a state on the global stage that other people look to and say yeah that's the way a country should be run and i've said of iran's got just under a million lebanon 950,000 refugees hosted by the end of 2018 and we're spitting hit hairs about the 10 or maybe 20,000 who might have taken a boat and we're thinking at no point does anybody sit back to think they're on a boat in a dinghy with their family, at the very least, whether it's France or whether it's the UK, there should be a global response. I don't think it just should just fall on the UK. But at some point, we should have enough humanity to be able to say, let's sort this out properly, but while they're here, extend the humanity to them to be able to deal with the situation properly. Just as a point of information, uh, two asylum seekers who were going to be on this flight to Rwanda, which is due to leave at 9.30 this evening, um, they're, they're, they have uh, been told that they won't be on that flight. So it looks as if there will be fewer than five people on this flight. I mean, whatever your view on it, 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 it is a farce. That's farce. Um, right, we will continue with your calls in just a moment. 0345 6060 It's 16 minutes past eight. This is LBC. My name's... Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. 
19 minutes past eight on LBC. Uh, there are two anniversaries today which you might like to ask our panel about. It's 40 years since we, uh, since the Argentinians surrendered to British forces on the Falklands. I think that's possibly worthy of a question. The Grenfell Tower disaster happened five years today as well. We were talking to the former Labour MP Emma Dent Code a little bit earlier. There's been a service at Grenfell Tower today which we've been covering this afternoon on LBC. But lots of other subjects that you might want to phone in and ask our panel about. We have Francis O'Grady, General Secretary of the TUC here, James Sunderland, Conservative MP for Bracknell, Ishan Akbar, comedian and podcaster, and Juliet Samuel, Telegraph columnist. Now, these four podcasts, I, I discovered you on a podcast, on Jeff Norcott's right. uh, what, what Most People Think, think podcast. Yeah. Um, what, what's your main podcast? What, 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 which is the one you'd like our listeners to listen to? I would like you all to listen to uh, my business podcast, 929. Because you used to be a banker, didn't you? I used to be a banker. I've worked in government policy. That's I was not rhyming speech. slang. No, it's not. Um, so I've done various things with my life. But yeah, have a listen to my 929. Have a listen to Have a Word. Have a Word is a hilarious podcast. It's really, really fun. And I'm very proud to be involved with it. So have a listen to that. Okay. There'll be some off-colour things being said on that. Excellent. That's what we like. Right, next question from Stephen Bexhill. Hello, Steve. Hello, Ian. Um, great listener. Many moons. Um, listen, right, um, the cost of living in this country, right, is getting rife. But the thing is, what we need to do is the people, what I want to speak to the panel, hello panel, is hello. <laughs> we, we need to not use these people that are coming over on boats, but farms are losing so much money. Vegetable farms are losing so much money. No one can pick their fruit and veg, yeah? Why can't we just get them picking the fruit and veg, right, while we settle their claims? Yeah, and they can earn a living and we can get taxes from them. OK, Steve, thank you very much for that. Well, we did discuss uh, the government's white paper on food strategy last night on the programme for an hour. We'll come to James on that because he, he's working at DEFRA now with George Eustace. Um, Ishan, do you want to start on this one? Well, some people might tell you, you never know who's going to come here. There might be a refugee who comes here and goes on a farm and decides he wants to use some of the pesticide to make a bomb. You don't know that, do you? This is the thing. I think it's a You mean fertiliser, not oh, is, I, I, I can't I mean, make I don't bombs. want to give people no tips, idea. but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Hot off the press. But this is the thing. I, think, I actually think it's a lovely idea, to be fair. Like, you know... Let's is that extending that sympathy and working with these people in the circumstances that they're in. Sure, some people might fall through the cracks and try to abuse the system, of course, but we can't possibly make our policy based on how the minority might behave. Surely, we can't be doing that, can we? I think a lot of policies are based on that, actually, and in in in. If you look in, in policing in particular and crime and justice, mm. you do have to sometimes make laws on how the minority might behave. Law, maybe, but not policy. Like, law, absolutely. I don't think everyone's a murderer, but of course you've got to have laws to stop people murdering yeah. one another. But that said, when, when people, when, when the basis of something is they are trying to seek asylum or they're trying to better their life or whatever it might be, we should be able to extend some sympathy and some kindness. Start from a position of kindness and see where you end up, is all I'm asking for, really. Julia, that makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, if we can have Ukrainians working in the economy, why can't we have other people working in the economy while, while their claims are being settled? Well, I think there's um, there's a difference as to how people have arrived here, right? Because the people arriving on boats, you know, we know have arrived illegally through, you know, a, a route that is run by people traffickers. If people have arrived here um, in another way and made an asylum claim, I think that's quite different. And I don't see why those people shouldn't be allowed but to But we know to that 75% of them will have their claims approved. So mm. on that basis, surely you could say, well, we might as well have them working in the economy, given that we have so many shortages in different sectors of the economy already. Well, we don't actually know exactly... We, we don't actually know exactly how many people um, disappear into the economy before they've even entered the system. So 75% uh, of those who enter the system maybe have their claims approved. But the whole point of this policy is not to... is, is to... Is to disincentivize the boats crossing the channel because that's that's the, the 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 starting point for all of this is we don't want people to cross the channel on boats we want people to come here and claim asylum in in a regular way where they can enter the system you know ideally uh w with their family or or you know 
bring their family but later. No but we route. don't. We there don't no want them. Well, there are, well they, in Syria, there were, there were safe routes set up in refugee camps where people's claims were assessed. There's a safe route for Ukrainians. It's not to come. for Iranians or Afghanistan. <clears throat> well, there. Well, the point. The the point is that they have come through maybe you know five. 10 countries on the way to this country to claim asylum if they're coming over a land route and then going through through the ocean. There are ample opportunities for them to claim asylum in a safe country as they go along. Well, so there, so there, is a, there is a legal route that they have bypassed But if you speak English and you've got family here, you naturally want to come here. Yeah, you may want to, but this is why the point of the scheme is to, is to is change when, incentives. When, 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 when you're being bombed out of your home, what you really want to do is look at mm. admin. What you really want to do is to make sure that you've got the legal routes absolutely nailed on, lest there be any trouble going down forward. It doesn't matter that your village has been completely ransacked. It doesn't matter that your children may have died. That doesn't matter, because the first thing is for you to get onto your well, phone. Well, I don't think people are, people are not being bombed as they pass through Europe on trains or in lorries on their way to um, smuggling operations on the coast. But on that, then basis, bring them over. On that basis, Every single asylum seeker coming from all of those different countries would settle in Greece or Turkey. Now, I mean, that, that isn't fair, is it? Surely we've got to take our fair share of people, given, I mean, some would argue, given what Ishan said about Britain's yes, role in should, a lot of these should, conflicts. we should, I agree. We should take our fair share of people. I would rather we took more people from Ukraine. I would rather we'd taken more people from Syria. I do not think that the way for us to take people is to see whoever can get here on a boat run by, you know, some kind of criminal gang and then say, you are the guys who we're going to take. What we should do is we should increase the number of people we take in other ways that make more sense. Okay. Francis. I, mean, let's I, I, the I think Steve made point. a really good point, which is that at the moment, uh, people who are desperate, who do manage to get here, who shouldn't be punished because uh, those boats are run by criminal gangs, you shouldn't be punishing the victims for that. You should be supporting the victims of that and people seeking asylum. But that while that, that's being processed... All asylum seekers say they want the chance to contribute. They want to be able to make a home and make a better life and be part of the community. And exactly as Steve says, at a time when we've got massive skill shortages, and by the way, Steve, not I wouldn't just be talking about farms. Again, when you, you meet asylum seekers, so many of them may be journalists, they may be teachers, they may be engineers, you know, it's from all walks of life. And it seems to me that if we can find a way to convert those skills and give people the opportunity to earn some money... Because we, we shouldn't run away with the impression that everybody who is a so-called illegal asylum seeker, in inverted commas, is somebody who is sort of at the bottom end of the skill scale. On the scale. contrary, mm. I mean, on the contrary you've got because doctors, you've got you're assuming, many, you're many journalists trade unionists also yeah. face pro uh, I, I would like I mean I would like to, I would like to ask you um uh well it, it, both of you but I I, I well you I may be wrong but I think James yet. yeah <laughs> whether, whether you whether you are whether you are okay with the situation in, in which the boats are flowing over the channel and maybe you are, and that's a consistent position. Well, no, if you are not, that's why I said, if you're not, I, well, if you, if you're not then then you have to you have, you have to, to say have a safe well, what, route, just but, like but, other but countries. But there is not going to be a safe route done. for everyone who wants to come. There just isn't. There's not going to be a situation right. where we where we say we are we are going to accept five million refugees, you know, over the next few years. That is that's not going to happen. Right, James wants to come in. At last. Thank you, Ian. Um, just to get back to the caller, Steve, I empathise with your view, actually, and you raise a very persuasive point. In my constituency, Bracknell, we've got near full employment. You talk to employers locally, I've got farms to the south of the constituency of Finch Hampstead. They cannot get enough staff. We haven't got enough people working. Yes, the quota has been increased this week from 30 to 40,000 people that can come here and work uh, with visas and work permits, but we need an awful lot more. So, so my view is that we have to leverage... But you're in government now, you can well, make this happen. And I'm, I'm pushing very hard for it to happen because ultimately this isn't about quotas, this is about getting enough people into the workforce that can help the 
country to create wealth. And by creating wealth, we can afford to pay for fantastic public services. The answer specifically regarding asylum seekers is they need to be processed fairly and quickly. We need to know who they are. The checks do need to happen. But once they're granted asylum, once they're given their right to stay, let's use these people. They bring fantastic skills with them. But if we can't get enough people through that route, and of course, you know, we do need to make sure that we do stop these illegal crossings because they are unsafe routes. Um, let's get people into the country that can contribute to the economy and let's get the workforce working. But why not allow them to work before they've been approved, given that 75% do get approval anyway? Wouldn't it make sense, given that we have all these labour shortages, and even if they are doctors, nurses, whatever, before they're approved, um, OK, they might have to do jobs which are a much lower skill than they're capable of doing, but surely that is just common sense. Yeah, look, I, I haven't got a definitive answer. I need to ask the Home Office on what that reason is, but I, I imagine that there is a need to make sure that the people are who they say they are. There could be a security implication. We need to make sure that, um, that, that you know, we know why they're here. Um, but ultimately, once they're processed and once they're given that right to stay, we should be getting as much out of these people as we can because they bring skills with them and there is a need for people to work in this country. Julia? Well, I, I disagree in the sense that I think if you have entered the asylum system, I think you should be allowed to work while your claim is processed. What I disagree with is doing nothing to address the incentives to get on a boat and cross the channel. 100%. Well, you, you have to then tackle the root causes, and that's and a much bigger question happening. of war, of climate change, of persecution, I, I mean, the U, human the UK, rights. The UK These does have big the biggest issues. aid budget and in the do. world by proportion of GDP to try and tackle this. But, you know, I, I do think, and I, yes, we should be trying to, and we are, but we're not, we're not going, we're not going to at the moment who solve enormous all of the numbers, world's problems. And I mean, we are one of the richest. The UK, right. the UK did not. I want to move on. We spent half an hour on two different aspects of this subject. Let's move on to something else in just a moment. It's 8.31 on LBC. Time for the news headlines with Andy Ivey. An Iraqi man has won a last-minute injunction from the European Court of Human Rights, stopping him from being flown from the UK to Rwanda on the first flight under the government's controversial relocation policy. Five other men lost challenges earlier at the High Court in London and the Supreme Court. The plane is yet to take off. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge have attended a service at Grenfell Tower in memory of the 72 men, women and children who died in a fire there five years ago. The royal couple laid a wreath and heard speeches which included calls for the arrest of those responsible for the tragedy in West London. An MP who made an unwanted sexual advance on a teenage member of staff faces a two-day suspension from the House of Commons. Patrick Grady of the SNP says he's profoundly sorry for his behaviour after being found to have breached Parliament's sexual misconduct policy. LBC weather dry tonight with clear spells. Tomorrow sunny across most of England and Wales. Some showers elsewhere. Highs of 27 degrees. LBC. Fever dream. with Ian Dale on LBC.
8.33 on LBC. Francis O'Grady is here, General Secretary of the TUC. James Sunderland, Conservative MP for Bracknell. Ishan Akbar, comedian and podcaster. And The Telegraph columnist, Juliet Samuel. Now, this Saturday, Francis, you've been trying to basically persuade me to go on your march. The last... Not just you, Ian. Not just me, no. But that would be an important part <laughs> of it, obviously. Obviously. Thousands you, can of ca- you can help carry the go, banner. To go, <laughs> to go on this march. What's it all about? So, um... Thousands of people will be gathering together in Portland Place in London uh, by midday on Saturday, marching to Parliament Square, saying we demand better because I think people have had it up to here in terms of the cost of living crisis. Um, the uh, We've heard today uh, real wages down on this time last year, on average, £26 a week in real terms. Uh, people are really struggling with prices going How through How does a march affect any of that? We want to send a really clear message that we're fed up with uh, workers being expected to pay the price, that people need a pay rise, and they need decent employment rights too. You know, the Prime Minister promised us 20 times the government on 20 separate occasions that we would have stronger rights at work to keep pace with what's happening because we've had fire and rehire, we've had the spread of zero hours contracts, we've had P&O, the absolutely shameful episode in our history of industrial relations in this country and you know enough is enough. People want action and we've been promised those employment rights. Where are they? Uh, you know, why aren't we getting to grips those with the fact there are millions Francis of Francis is looking at James the whole time she's saying this. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I was in workshop last night in Nottinghamshire <laughs> to talking, talk, yeah, like yeah. all the glamour jobs. It, the brilliant people uh, talking to workers at B&Q, at uh, the bakeries, care workers and the common thread to all of them was that They genuinely, there is no fat left to trim. You know, there are uh, teachers talking about kids going into school who are saving half their school dinner to take home because they don't know whether they're going to get tea that night. You know, uh, this... this we're talking about an absolute so if, epidemic. So if people want to come on the march, standards. they just turn up. You don't have to register anything. Oh no, you don't have to register, just Ian. You, just we'll we'll recognise you, and like I say, yeah, you can help carry I'm, the banner. I'm busy on Saturday. <laughs> I've told you. I've oh been to yeah, a but this party. is but, yeah, but this <laughs> is going to be even more fun because it is a it's a real family affair as well. It's for everybody who wants action, okay. and, and we've been promised it. Where is that action from the government? Well, we've got a sort of slightly related question here from Khaled in Wimbledon. And Khaled, what would you like to ask? Good evening, Ian. Good evening, panel. Yeah, against Hi. the background of uh, economic uncertainty with the cost of living crisis, rising inflation and utility bills and all that, um, the Bank of England is still indicating to financial markets that they're going to increase interest rates quite significantly through the rest of the year. And my question, therefore, is um, are we headed for a hard landing? Because this week's economic data was uh, quite weak. Well, Juliet, you write about economics a lot. Do you, do you want to go first? Yeah, I um, I feel quite bleak about the prospects for the economy um, because I think we've only got the start of the inflation shock that's still to come through. Um, there's still a lot to come through food prices, for example, which are a huge part of uh, of people's, people's outgoings. Uh, the energy price uh, shock is probably got more to come and then there's going to be a massive increase in the uh the 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 cap the energy price cap in the autumn um there's talk of rationing energy uh for you know possibly for industrial users which will probably lead to a rise in unemployment um and i don't see you know and and then you've got the bank of england you know then the need for the bank of england to raise rates <clears throat> which they're probably not doing fast enough uh to abate some of this inflation uh, and to stop a spiral from taking off and making the situation even worse but of course if and when they do catch up and raise rates higher that's going to hit costs across the whole economy everyone who has a debt is going to just see their their costs rise massively so you know i think it's 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 a pretty bleak picture. I do think we're headed for a recession. Mm. Um, I think there's a slightly limited amount the government can do. They could probably support more households who um, poorer households, and they probably will have to again in the winter, is my guess. Uh, but you know, I mean, it, some of the a lot of these shocks are are not within the government's control. The reason this is different from the inflation crisis of the 1970s is because 
It's a global thing, isn't it? It's largely about the lack of supply. So mm. therefore, if there's a lack of supply and the demand's still there, prices go up. And this is happening in loads of other countries. Mm. So there's a limit to what the government can do, and yet people expect the government to help in these circumstances. Yeah, I mean, what the government can try to do is to support poor households, you know, to get through it. Um, you know, well, to be honest, though, what they could have done is if they hadn't spent the last 20 years faffing about not having an energy policy mm. and actually building a bunch of nuclear power plants and um, changing the incentives of the gas market so that we don't have this crazy system where everything is priced at the most expensive gas in the system, and also explain exploiting the North Sea and exploiting shale, then we wouldn't be in this situation. So there was a lot are. the government well, could have done right now. You know, anything it can do will take at okay. least a few years. Um, James Sunderland, well, you, you represent a fairly leafy constituency, quite a well-to-do mm. well, well constituency at any rate. Um, what's your post back telling you? A lot of things at the moment. Um, what I would say to you is, as a politician, I would love to be able to support everybody that writes to me and all those across the UK that are in need. That's not possible. Um, we're £2.2 .2 trillion pounds in debt. Um, the inflation crisis currently is a global crisis caused for a, a variety of reasons. And, and ultimately, of course, we want to help everybody at all. I'm pretty satisfied right now that the Chancellor is doing what he can to help. Package of measures announced last week, I think, was quite radical, quite supportive. I agree that there's more that needs to be done. Tax could come down in terms of VAT and certain products. I think that there's more we can do to um, subsidise the poorest houses. So I'm not immune at all to the need to do an awful lot more. Um, but there are multiple <coughs> conditions here um, that the government can't necessarily solve. I am concerned about interest rates going up, although that's in terms of monetary policy, sensible. It's likely to bring inflation down, and it needs to come down. Of course, we then disincentivize those who want to borrow for business purposes. We sort of stifle economic growth. So finding the fine line here um, between too much government action and too little is very, very different. And um, ultimately, I empathize massively with all those that write to me and give me um, give me their issues. It um, doesn't put bread on the table, though, does it? No, no it doesn't. But uh, again, the government's doing what it can to help. Um, we've got the energy subsidy at the moment. Universal Credit's doing what it can. It's not the panacea. I get that. Um, we also had an awful lot of money spent keeping people's jobs going, livelihoods. The government was very generous during the pandemic. The economy was in a pretty good place relatively when we left the pandemic, when it left behind us. Um, we were, um, and still may be, one of the fastest growing co countries in the G7. So the government Not hasn't got it wrong. Then. Well, indeed, well, the projections are... We're going to be the lowest in the well, G20. This, this, this is the thing. The projections are quite worrying. So what the Prime Minister, number 10, Chancellor does now is really, really important. And what we need to be doing, Ian, is we need to be learning from past lessons that we don't spend our way out of uh, out of the problem. We don't... Well, that's exactly the what we are doing. Though. Mm. I mean, it's what we did in the pandemic. It's what the Chancellor has been doing ever since he's been Chancellor. And yet Francis will tell us that he hasn't spent enough. Well, I think we've had 12 years of real wages falling, and that was based on austerity. It was based on uh, refusing to improve workers' rights and level I'll up tell you, the bargaining table. George Osborne table. was sitting in that very seat earlier this evening. Well, we've uh, also had, we've George also Osborne, had years of low inflation. Uh, conservative and... chancellors across the last decade and more have <clears> failed <throat> to get us into a better position because I think hiding behind the skirts of uh, the global energy crisis isn't good enough other countries and other families in other countries were in a better position to face this crisis because wages were rising in those countries after the global financial crash. They haven't been rising in real terms here. Well, they, and, and well, in fact, well, to, be, to be accurate, they were, but had only just got back to 2008 we, levels when the pandemic hit. Well, and now we are facing real <clears throat> wage cuts, uh, a shrinking economy and projected to be only better than Russia in the OECD uh, projections on GDP growth. So, and you they're know, busy. We're, we're, and they, mm. they're being hit by sanctions. So that is nothing to be proud of. Where is the government's industrial strategy? Why did it take so long to introduce the windfall tax that the TUC called for back in October? Uh, and the government mm. still doesn't want to call a windfall tax on greedy like Eight months companies. is quite quick for government. <laughs> Again, I mean, the, 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 the left loves to blame as, the government. As, as we loves had on furlough, government. when... 
the trade union movement stepped up, came up with that proposition around furlough, and the government did listen. <clears throat> Ever since, we've had a kind of back to business as usual, get back in your box, uh, let's pick a fight with the unions and blame them for everything. What, like strikes? You know, well, you know... Yeah, let's go on whether, strike. A That's whole really sensible. series of... Why do you think... Do you understand why those workers that the Transport Secretary described as heroes during the pandemic for getting key workers into their jobs and for moving freight around the country who are now facing a real struggle with household bills? Do you understand why all, they might look, democratically vote look, to withdraw their labour? We're all in this a together. British we're all in this together. It's a collective defend. responsibility to do what we have to do as a country to pull us out of it. I'm confident Well, we then will. bring us around the table and let's very, try and very get good an agreement. People, some very good brains in number 10 and in the treasury do some fantastic work right now well, i dread the thought of a labor government being in power let's right now. let's start right. with tackling soaring levels of child poverty let's, in this country which shame us all let's start by going to isha and he can give us a solution to all oh this. yeah absolutely you know <clears throat> i'm having spent six years in in the city and now my life as a comedian you can imagine my parents really trust my judgment on anything <laughs> so i wonder how anybody else does ultimately again let's just go back i i, mean, I observed the world around me do people feel at the moment that they are getting bang for their buck? Are they living the life that they want to be able to live? Is it harder to just live every day? And the answer is yes. Now, of course, we can say that there's a lot of global shocks to the economy that may be beyond the control of a particular incumbent government at any one particular time. Absolutely, I concede that point. But fundamentally, this goes back to the kind of nation state that we want to be. Have we been thinking about the future of this country? I get it. We've had the pandemic. We've got this war going on in Ukraine. So there has to be a degree of short termism. But I don't know, maybe, maybe there's a bigger conversation about how long uh, governments uh, are in power for. But there never seems to be a consistent. We do too much politicking. There never seems to be this idea of saying over the next 20, 30, 40 years mm. for the country, irrespective mm. of whether we have a Labour or a Conservative government, for the country, this is what we should be aspiring to be doing. And the method to get to that point may differ. But ultimately, the purpose of why we exist is to make sure that subsequent generations are able to have a better life and be able to improve. And I'm lucky that I'm in one of those businesses where I can, but I don't know whether if I were to have children or beyond, whether their life would be better than mine. Mm. And that surely is a concern. That's an interesting point because we did have essentially about 30 years, I'd say between uh, 1980 and 2010, where you had Conservative and Labour governments effectively following similar... There was a broad 100%. consensus, wasn't there? Yeah. But because of the financial crash, things changed. Yeah. And then we we went back to the 70s with Jeremy Corbyn as opposition leader, and then there was this great divide. And a lot of people actually would think that's a good thing because you knock on someone's door and they say, well, there's no difference between the parties. Why should we bother voting? And right. when Corbyn was leader, there was a choice between yeah. the two parties. I, th I think it's even deeper than that. You know, if you think there used to be a broad consensus around what, everything from asylum seekers to social insurance, decent sick pay, yeah. you know... Uh, proper protection when you became unemployed, income related. Mm. That, that was the kind of thing that had a consensus right across the political spectrum mm. and that has been shattered. Yeah. And I think we need to try and build back a, a build social back consensus. Build, 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 build back better. better. That's, That's what, what we need to I, do, I, isn't I, it? I, 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 I just I, want I, some reality I, in I, addition I to the slogans. The 70s. I can recall winter of discontent as a kid. I can recall the early 80s as well. The UK has come a long way since then. Living standards have gone up. The quality of life has or gone who? up. For, for the vast majority in the UK. And, and what I would say to you, we've got more people in work today than ever before. This is not a bad place okay. to be. We knock the UK, we knock what the government's not doing. But actually, if it was so bad, people wouldn't be but, seeking to come. You know, um, if, if you take city bonuses on. out, that real uh, living standards are, are We've got to move on, Francis. But just this text from Andrew and Ealing, I've got to read out. As usual, you journalists don't even know what inflation is. Inflation is too much currency in circulation, and that is, it's got nothing to do with the supply chain. It's too much money being printed. Get it right, please. Well, I think we're both right, because you, you are absolutely That's right crazy. on that. Yeah. Too much money was printed. No, but that doesn't include price inflation. No, I'm but, really but there is also... There are various different types of inflation, yeah. and what we've got at the moment is almost a perfect storm, haven't we? Yeah. Where you've got uh, all this money that was printed over the past 10 years mm. and then these supply chain issues. So I maintain that 
I was right, but you were right too, Andrew. Can it, I just say No, you can't. 840. <laughs> LBC, Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Foreign Secretary Liz Truss joins me now. Deportation plans for people back to Rwanda. Senior members of the Church of England say that this is something that shames us as a nation. Are you part of a government that shames the nation? I don't agree with that assessment at all. We are carrying out this policy to deal with the appalling people trafficking. The cost of the flight to be somewhere in the region of 350 to 400 thousand pounds. Is that value for money, Foreign Secretary? Fundamentally, we need to break the business model and this is why we have to take this action. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player LBC. Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. 10 to 9. Francis O'Grady, James Sunderland, Ishan Akbar, and Juliet Samuel with me taking your calls and texts. Andrea in Kensington says Five years after fire ripped through Grenfell Tower in West London, an inquiry has laid bare the string of failures. 72 people died. Why are they still waiting for justice? Mm. Francis. Do you know, I, I was thinking I was at an event with um, Steve Rotherham and Andy Burnham about Hillsborough. And it, it, the echoes are so clear that uh, ultimately, for me anyway, it feels like ordinary working people resident in Grenfell were valued less. Um, there was a string of... Um, disasters from privatisation to deregulation to, uh, you know, I remember, remember after the South London fire in 2013, the coroner actually said we need to... Tighten, like an old house, was that? We need to tighten building regulations. And ministers said that would be a burden on business. We've had companies who put profit over people, uh, we, you know, a council. But there is, no there is, it seems to me, a rigorous inquiry going on. So I, I completely understand the so, frustration of people that it has been five years. But from what I can see, and I've talked to our correspondent Rachel Venables, who follows this literally on a daily basis, it is a rigorous inquiry, and we will get to the truth. I, I, I agree, we'll get the truth. Will we get the justice? Because one of the things that's been laid bare is that fragmentation of responsibility, the buck passing that has gone on with everybody washing their hands. And, you know, it feels it was criminal. And yet I can't see anybody ending up in the dock because of this currently. Uh, there seem, you know, it, it seems like yet again, it's like p &O and all the rest of it, yet again, the villains get away with it and they price it in and people have lost their lives. There were lessons that could and should have been learned that we shouldn't talk about all a regulation as red tape and a burden on business. This is about protecting people's safety and in this case, their lives. Um, and I think government needs to step up 
and take responsibility for its part in running a system that allowed that to happen. Okay, Ishan. I love our fascination with inquiries. We love an inquiry. I can't wait till, you know, if I have children, Charles says to me, can I have this McDonald's? I said, let me hold an inquiry for you and then let's see, let's see. We, inquiries seem to delay Those all this. parent, you're judge and jury. Yeah, well, you're quite. <laughs> so there's that. But also, you know, if you're one of the 72, if you're one of the 72 Grenfell victims, uh, families and you're, or, or families or friends and you're listening to this, it seems like you're going to get more attention if you suddenly become a Ukrainian refugee. Like, it just seems like the attention that these people should be getting, should have received up to this point, it goes back to the care, mm. kindness and compassion that we afford citizens either of our own country or people who appear onto these shores. There is a lack of kindness and empathy that has been afforded to people for a very long time in the UK. And that makes me a little bit embarrassed. And I've said it already before, Grenfell is yet another example of this. And I look, I don't know whether it's because they were poor. I don't know whether it's because they're predominantly ethnic minority. I don't know whether it's because we just don't care. People don't want to have those uncomfortable conversations, but something's amiss. I don't know if the same thing would have happened if there was a, a, an apartment block in Mayfair that burnt down or an apartment block in Canary Wharf that burnt down? Would we have waited this long to get an answer as to why that happened? That's a good question, isn't it, actually, James yeah. Sunderland? I was watching Newsnight last night, and I watched that documentary, and I will freely admit that uh, the shivers went through me. It was a difficult, difficult watch, and my heart goes out to all of the families. In fact, there was one lady interviewed who was talking about the difference between the family next door who were told to stay put, and they died, and the family in the next door flat who saw smoke in the room and they, they left. I mean, this is ghastly, absolutely ghastly. You know, I'm a parent, we're all parents, families. I mean, this is pretty horrific stuff. Um, what I would say to you is that the UK is not shy of getting to the truth. The UK is not shy of bringing people to justice. And what I would say to you is that when the inquiry is completed and we've got the facts and we've got the evidence, it is clear that prosecutions need to follow. Okay. Well, that Francis. includes ministers holding up their hands because one, uh, one other thing that I found really, really hard to stomach was that there was an attempt to blame the very people who ran towards the fire when everybody else was running away, and that was firefighters and the control staff, who themselves, yet again, had warned after that 2013 fire that the, they, were, they were challenging the stay put mm. policy. They obviously weren't equipped to deal with a fire that, in a block that was illegally clad with inflammable <laughs> uh, materials, but they had also raised questions about the stay put policy. Mm. And yet there, there seemed to be, in my view, an orchestrated attempt to blame firefighters by people who are not fit to lace their boots frankly. Okay. I agree. So, I mean, if I may, uh, Ian, very quickly. Very, very quickly. What happened was a terrible accident. Um, and, I, and I think that we do need to get to the truth and, and make the appropriate finding. But it was a terrible accident. Accidents do happen, but but we have to get accident to the truth. Accident of our own making. Well, yes, indeed. Okay. We have to get to the truth and then deal with it. Right. Um, Ruby in Cleethorpes, and I need 30, 45 second answers on this one. Uh, Nick Ferrari asked Liz Truss this morning if the Falklands War was the last virtuous war we've had, referencing chaotic scenes from the Afghanistan evacuation. Mm. She didn't really answer. How would the panel answer? Juliet. I think maybe until the war in Ukraine, that was true. Not that we are direct combatants, but as supporters... Mission? Pretty much agree, but I, I don't know what war is really that virtuous, really, ultimately. I think standing up to dictators and a flagrant breach of international law and invasion is, is virtuous, isn't it? Well, yeah, but then that suggests that we, as a nation, have never breached international law ourselves. No, we've been hypocrites. And we just do it in specific and limited ways. <laughs> All right, OK. Uh, James Sunderland. Yeah, I mean, Falklands is a pretty clear cut. It was an act of unprovoked... You, you were in the impression. armed forces. I was in the armed forces, served in the Falklands, uh, not in 82, since then, twice. Um, so I know the place quite well, but the important thing for me is that uh, there was an act of aggression. Um, Margaret Thatcher made the right decision, sending British forces down there. We retook the islands. And, of course, the garrison that's there today is a continuing vindication of the fact that uh, we support the islanders and their right to self-determination. And, okay. uh, and, and rightly so. Francis? Can I make a different point as a trade unionist, which is that lots of 
veterans yeah. from the services working at our fire service, the railways. Yeah. I don't think ministers sometimes forget that, the prison service. Very often they come into civilian life having experienced pretty awful traumas. Yeah. Uh, they don't get the mental health support they need. They don't get the housing. They don't get the retraining and support. Unions can help them and I really hope they join us on Saturday. Which didn't answer the question, virtuous war, since the forecast. I've, uh, you know, for me, I'm not a pacifist. I do believe there can be just wars, but it's um, a bit like uh, people voting for strikes. It's always the last resort and people don't do it lightly. You know, you've got to have tried every other avenue and try to negotiate. Well, I'm going to name Kosovo, to Sierra Leone, and I would make an argument for Afghanistan, but we haven't got time, so I won't. Not the way we left, though. That wasn't virtuous. No. Final text from Jake in Southampton to lighten the mood a bit. Kate Bush's Running Up That Hill looks likely to get number to number one in the charts this week. Which song from the past deserves a revival? Oh, I can think of so many. Miss You Nights, Cliff Richard, definitely. Ishan. Wake me up before you go-go. <laughs> Juliet. It'd have to be something from David Bowie, but I'm not sure they've gone away. Maybe Ashes to Ashes. Yeah. Francis. Sam Cooke, A Change Is Gonna Come. I don't know that one. James. The first single I ever bought, Don't Stop Me Now by Queen. <laughs> OK. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I admit what the first single I ever bought was? Yes, please. Long Haired Lover from Liverpool by Jimmy, o <laughs> Little Jimmy Osmond. <laughs> Uh, like we like to, Ishan. This is your first appearance. We like to end the program on a high note, and that was it. That was what a lovely note that is. Yeah, <laughs> very good. Thank you all very much indeed, Francis O'Grady, James Sunderland, Ishan Akbar, and Juliet Samuel. Coming up in a moment, we're going to continue our discussion on Rwanda and the fact that this plane is supposedly going to leave the airport in uh, Wiltshire. In about half an hour, we'll cross to our reporter, Matthew Thompson, who I assume is still there waiting for that to happen. And uh, we'll get your views on whether the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Church of England are right when they say this is a shameful episode for our country. 0345 6060 973. You're listening to LBC. I'm Ian Dale. It's nine o'clock. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom, it's still unclear how many asylum seekers will be on board the government's first deportation flight to Rwanda. It's due to take off from an RAF base in Wiltshire. In a last-minute ruling, the European Court of Human Rights has confirmed that at least one man, an Iraqi national, can't be forcibly removed from Britain tonight. And it's understood another man...